Oh, I wasn't going to say, but he said it. Now everybody knows. <laughs> um, so, uh, have you guys heard about this, where, where people have claimed that Jesus was married? Um, no? Yeah? Okay. Um, anything that, that you wanted to wanted to share that you heard about it? Maybe something you looked up that, that you found was interesting? I heard that he was married to Mary Magdalene. Yeah. The, the um, woman who had the demons in her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then I, yeah, something similar. When he said that, uh, yeah, Jesus had sex with Mary. Heard that. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I heard something similar from what he said. Anybody else? I actually came across an article on it the other day on my Facebook. I didn't read it, but there, it, it, it is being talked about. Yeah. Was it uh, on the side of it happened, or was it on the side of it didn't happen? Uh, I think it was on the side that, side that it did happen. I think, I'm think i trying to think if it was on the belief in that. I think it was. So I, mean, I was going to go look it up and have about the chance. Then you got high? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So um, we're going to look at um, some of the evidence for it and, and against it, obviously. And then I'm going to, rather than tell you what to look for in an article, I'm going to show you an article that says that he was married, and I'm going to show you how to analyze an article. Because, honestly, when you guys leave Young Adults Ministries, when you leave here, you're going to be faced with the real world, and they're going to come at you and say, hey, th this is true, and you're going, to say, you're going to have to be able to determine, are they making this up, or is this fact? Right. See what I mean? Because the world's going to say a lot of different things. For instance, um, there are some people who think that um, they found uh, something in our DNA that makes us gay. And there's some people who say, no, that's not true. Same thing with alcohol. You know what I mean? Well, how do we know? See what I mean? H how do we know? We can't just instantly discredit something, right? We have to critically analyze the information. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, so the first thing... There, there's really two two sources that where we get this information about Jesus being married. The first is a fragment, okay, that was found, I believe, in it was 1900 somewhere, either the 20s or the 50s somewhere. And um, it why I say fragment, and I really want to emphasize that, okay, is because first off, it's out of context. We don't know what comes before that fragment or what came after it. It's a very broken. Fragment, And then the next part is that it's not even full sentences. We don't even know what Jesus is talking about. He could be talking about, like, for instance, um, the bride, you know, the church. He could be talking about that. Mm -hmm. But it's just very, it's very ambiguous wording. We don't actually know for sure what the heck he's talking about. And then also to this, um, to this thing here that it's, it's just a fragment, that we don't even know what he's talking about, we don't know the context of what he's talking about, is that it can, comes from the 4th century. Okay, so let's do some math. Jesus died in the 30s AD. It comes from the 300s AD. Mm. See what I mean? Yeah. At best, you can date it as a tradition that goes all the way back to the 100s AD. But that's still 70 years after Jesus. See what I mean? So at best, it still is not that reliable of a source. And once again, this is one fragment but we have no idea what the context is, and it's broken up sentences. Right. It says th things like, um, Jesus said, then uh, yeah, you go down and it says something about wife, and then it says something about a kid or something like that. It's like, well, what, are, what is he talking about? He's talking about that he was married and that he had kids. Maybe. Maybe. Right. But <laughs> let's not rush to say this is what it's saying when we really don't know. Um, the next thing is that it has been proposed that this is a fraudulent fragment. There is nothing really strong that supports this, but it is something that has been hypothesized. It's a possibility that it's a fraudulent fragment. Okay, I just want to throw this out there because you're going to see people say, that was disproven. Well, not quite. It, it might actually be legit. Okay. Um, the next thing that I want to look at is something called an argument from silence. Do you guys know what that means? An argument from silence. Uh, an idea you can, in your mind. You can have a, good guess. Yeah. Uh, that's not what it means, but that, that's actually a good guess. Yeah. 
An argument from silence pretty much says this. Because something didn't say it, it must not be true. And I'll show you the example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, it says, uh, Paul's writing to the Corinth church, and he writes, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, who is Peter? And the argument then goes, well, if, if Jesus had a wife, this would have been a great time to bring it up. But also in the same chapter, he talks about staying celibate, not marrying. Right. And he could have brought Jesus up for that one too, and he didn't. So, see what I mean? The problem with an argument from silence is that it's silent on the issue. It doesn't clarify. It doesn't say. So then say, oh, that must mean that Jesus was or was not married. Little yeah. little doll there. You, you really don't have anything to argue with. Um, basically, that would be, be the equivalent of saying... Chuck didn't say that he didn't rape somebody, so he might have raped somebody. See what I mean? That would be an, an argument from silence. Because he didn't say something, that must mean it's true. See what I mean? Um, okay, so the Bible is silent on whether or not Jesus was married or not. The Bible itself, as far as <laughs> biblical, canonical Christianity, the Bible does not clarify one way or another. It doesn't say he was single, and it doesn't say he was married. But here's the flip side of that. The early church all pretty much said that he wasn't married. And the only people who kind of had the idea that he might have been married um, are a little bit more vague than, you, than we'd like to think. Okay, and I'll, I'll kind of look at this in a minute. Um, but here's two articles that you guys can look at. One is a, a website called Got Questions. Okay. Um, it, it's a very brief article, but but it's it's it sum, summarizes all you know, all, all of it pretty good. Um, and you just go you just type in Google got questions was Jesus married and it should bring it up. Or if you go to the website got questions and then type into that it should bring it up. Um, the next one is call is a website called Answers in Genesis. If you want, I can I can share these two links on the on the Yams Facebook page if that would make it easier. Whatever you guys want to do, um, but it's from that website. And it talks about uh, Jesus uh, slash Jesus Christ slash was Jesus uh, married slash. Uh, they they both have some interesting things to say. They both take the take the stance that, that it's not true. Okay, um, I would say Got Questions is probably a little bit more of a professional website than Answers in Genesis is, but that's just my take. Um, they're both yeah, they're yeah. both sources. Um, and so the one we're gonna look at is from Huffington Post. Um, which, if you guys know, it, it's a news site kind of online. It, it's, it tends to be more liberal in, in its things, and so it's going to claim that Jesus was married. Okay, now I'm going to I'm going to take you through how you would um, how you would look at this information and see if it's accurate or if it's not accurate, if they're making it up or if it, if it's true. Okay, and the thing you have to realize is a lot a lot of these things where people try to disprove something that tradition uh, Christianity is held to is is they always they always use these sources that are very vague. You know, um, oh, well, so-and-so said. It's like, well, do you have any data for that? Or, see what I mean? Um, or uh, they rely on secret knowledge where it's like, well, it could have happened. There could have been a secret society that was keeping this hidden knowledge about Jesus that died out. It could have happened. I guess, but Superman also could have existed. You know what I mean? Like, eh, we don't really, don't really have any compelling reason to believe that Christianity was traded out for a lie, okay? And we'll look at that in a second, but also a lot of it is going to be from speculation, and I think that that's kind of important. Right. It'll just take it a minute to load up. Now, the first step, whenever you read an article in the newspaper or whatever, and it says something that you're like, do I believe in this? Is this something that, that, that we can take seriously? The first step is to always check the website, make sure it's a legit website like New York Times or something like that, okay? The second step is, does that uh, website or newspaper or whatever, does it normally say things that are a little bit possible or does it normally say things unbiased this is what, it, what what the fact is see what i mean 
And then the third thing is you have to look at the author or whoever uh, substantiated it. Because sometimes this person has a doctorate degree in what? Puppeteering? Pottery. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? Like, well, maybe they know what they're talking about, but maybe not. So, the, so after you've confirmed that the website is actually legit, you need to look at the person, see if they are actually legit. Right. Now, what is an example of a not legit website for information? Um, yeah. Right there, bam, Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia is called an open source encyclopedia. That means anybody can add to it yeah. or take away from it, which means it doesn't necessarily have to be proofread. It's not scholarly. Okay? Um, I thought it was a scam artist. I don't know if he said something topic or not. I thought of, uh, from what he said. I, I can't, I can't. No Caffrey. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a white guy. Never mind. My jokes. <laughs> At least I laughed, right? <laughs> I got to hear. I got to hear. Okay, here we go. So this is by a guy named... Yeah. Simcha Jakobovich. I don't know, guys. I'm really, I'm really sorry. Uh, it says there he's a three-time Emmy-winning filmmaker and New York Times best-selling author. Okay. So let's kind of take that apart. First off, Emmy-winning filmmaker. Well, we need to discover what what that's about, but it's right. not really relevant for today, so we're not going to look at that. Um, the second thing is New York Times best-selling author. All that means is that a certain number of their books have been sold and, and it got some attention from New York Times. Right. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily legit. That just means, you see what I mean? Uh -huh. You can't say, okay, so it's definitely fact based off that. You still have to take it with a grain of salt. So let's look at the article itself. <clears throat> the publication on November 12, 2014 of the book, co wrote with Professor Barry Wilson, The Lost Gospel Decoding the Ancient Text that Reveals Jesus' Marriage to uh, Mary the, uh, the Magdalene, has caused a worldwide theological firestorm, including demonstrations in India. I was even the butt of one of Bill O'Reilly's attacks, and I've challenged him to an on-air debate so far he's demurred. Okay, so let's look at the article itself. <clears throat> I think the reason for all of this negativity is that, proof, is that the proof for the historical marriage between Jesus of Nazareth and the woman known as Mary the Magdalene has become overwhelming. Even before our findings, everything, everything pointed to a marriage and nothing, nothing argued for Jesus' celibacy. The only thing that continues to argue for Jesus' celibacy is 2,000 years of theological bullying. This may come as a shock to most people, but the fact is that none of the four Gospels say that Jesus was celibate. The Gospels call Jesus rabbi. Um, rabbis then, as now, are married. If Jesus wasn't married, someone would have noticed. The greatest promoter of celibacy of Christians was Paul. On every other matter of Jewish law, and Paul was a Jew called Saul at birth, Paul was lax. He threw out kosher laws, ignored Sabbath observance, and prayed that the hands of ritual circumcisers shake so that they cut off their own penises when they performed circumcision. Only when it came to sex, Paul was more severe than Moses and Jesus put together. Why? The answer may lie in Paul's background. As everyone knows, Paul of Tarsus came from Tarsus, an area of modern-day Turkey. What people don't know is that in the Tarsus of Paul's day, they worshipped a god named Attis. Perhaps not coincidentally, Attis was a dying, and a dying and resurrecting god. He was called the Good Shepherd, and his earliest depictions show him with a sheep across his shoulders. All these images were later incorporated into the iconogra iconography of Paul's version of Christianity. Put simply, Paul's Jesus looks a lot like Attis. Addis had a great love in his life, uh, in his, a great love in his life, uh, Sebel. On their wedding night, Addis decided to make the supreme, uh, make the supreme sacrifice and offer his tes testicles on the offer of his love. He, su he surprised, he surprised his virgin bride by castrating himself. This idea was a big hit in the Tarsus of Paul's day. Addis' priest, the galley, would imitate the god uh, by going into a frenzy, emasculating themselves and offering their testicles. Those holy sacrifices. Not surprisingly, this once popular religion died out. For his part, Paul didn't promote little literal castration, although some early Pauline uh, Christians, Church Father Origen, did ca did castrate themselves. In the spirit of Addis, Paul advocated abstinence and celibacy even in marriage. That's not good. Uh, the 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 page dialogue is what I'm talking about. Um, let me see if maybe if I close this down. It'll give it the extra juice it needs, huh? Ah, it did. Um, 
in the spirit of Addis, Paul advocated abstinence and celibacy even in marriage. Had Jesus been celibate, Paul would certainly have invoked him as an example when arguing for celibacy, but he doesn't. Never once does Paul argue that the Christians should be celibate because Jesus was celibate, not once. If one looks at the Gospels without Addis colored Pauline gla glasses, there are many, many hints that Jesus was married. Specifically after the crucifixion, the Gospels agree that it was Mary Magdalene who went early Sunday morning to wash and anoint Jesus' crucified body. Uh, people have the quaint idea that ancient Jews in Jerusalem went around anointing each other. They didn't. What the Gospels are telling us is that Mary the Magdalene went to Jesus' tomb to prepare his body for burial. That's the Gospels, not me. Then and now, no woman would touch the naked body of a dead rabbi, rabbi unless she was family. Jesus was whipped, beat, and crucified. No woman wash, uh, would wash the blood and sweat off of his private parts unless she was his wife. Besides the canonical go uh, Gospels, there are so-called Gnostic Gospels. This Gnostics, or wisdom seekers, were an early branch of, of Christianity, whose origins we don't know. What we do know is that, the, is that they represent the losers in the Christian Orthodoxy game. After the 4th century, the church burnt Gnostic holy books and the people who believed in them. As a result, until recently, we had almost no Gnostic Gospels to refer to. And then he goes on talking about how they found the Nag Hammadi um, Gnostic Gospels. So, what do you do with an article like this? When you find it, and it, it says stuff that you're like, oh no, it, it has definitive proof, and, it, and it's by a legitimate guy. Well, let's take this apart. Let's start with his first sentence here. I think the reason for all this negativity is the proof uh, of the historical marriage between Jesus of Nazareth and the woman known, known as Mary. First off, saying something does not make it true. No. So that's the first thing you need to He says this very, very substantially. Everything pointed to a marriage. Nothing argued for Jesus' celibacy. See what I mean? He just says something powerfully, and he thinks that, that makes it true. So there's the first red flag that should go up. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean that it's true. Now let's look at the actual content itself. Um, the only thing that continues to argue for Jesus' celibacy is 2,000 years of theological bullying. Not quite. We'll get to that in a minute. This may come as a shock to most people, but the fact is that none of the four Gospels say that Jesus was celibate. Yes, that is true. However, none of them say that he was married either, so that really doesn't prove a point one way or another, does it? The next thing, uh, rabbis then as now are married. Actually, this is not true. Historically, at the time of Jesus, rabbis didn't have to be married in order to be ordained as a rabbi. Right. Ra Jesus was not called rabbi. If you read the Gospels, Jesus was called rabbi in the sense of teacher. And in that sense, there was nothing wrong with that. There was no expectation for him to have been married. It was afterwards, after the times of Jesus, by even possibly hundreds of years, that rabbis were expected to get married. So there is that too. Also, there's the idea that in the Gospels, he doesn't really talk about it so cut and dry as, as he's making it out to be. Um, the people, when they're, when they're calling him rabbi, it's like because he's teaching. So yeah. they call him teacher. Right. See what I mean? It really has nothing to do with the orthodoxy of Judaism. See what I mean? So there's that. But he threw it in there as though it's fact. Rabbis are married. Therefore, Jesus was married. But nobody selected him as a rabbi. Well, yeah. Uh... What? It's not like he was ordained to be a rabbi. Right, that, that's what I'm saying is the whole ordained as a rabbi thing was a later argument. Right. Um, it's something that historically wasn't even a thing yet. That, that's, that's, that's my point. Um, and so what he did there is he took something that happened now, rabbis now have to do something, and then he said, so back then it had to happen too. That's not historically accurate. He, was not, he would not have been expected to get married even if he was ordained. But once again, that wasn't a thing back then. Okay, then let's go to the next part. Um, the greatest promoter of celibacy for Christians was Paul. Actually, Jesus talked about celibacy too. We'll talk about that probably next week when we talk about masturbation and uh, not marrying and if that's an actual uh, biblical answer and stuff. We'll look at that next week. Um, but um, so on every matter of Jewish law, and Paul uh, was a Jew called Saul at birth, Paul was lax. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, Paul just realized what Jesus' coming meant. Um, so let's hop down here. Only when it came to sex was Paul more severe than Moses and Jesus put together. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say that. Have you guys ever read the book of the law? The, the book of the law? Yeah, like Leviticus and Numbers and stuff. And this is, uh, um, In the Bible? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've read like uh, the beginning of the Bible. Yeah. Like Genesis and stuff like that. Right. But, uh, I haven't gone. Lost steam around Exodus, didn't you? 
Um, People normally do. <laughs> yeah, I guess I kind of gave up on that. <laughs> well, if you if you have read the law, Moses talks frequently about if you have a discharge, if you have this, if you have that. If get this, if if a priest had misshapen testicles, he couldn't serve as a priest. And you're honestly trying to contend that Paul is more severe than that. Mm. Not when read in context. Um, okay. Uh, as everyone knows, Paul. Paul of Tarsus came from Tarsus, an area of modern-day Turkey. That is true. Paul did come from Tarsus, okay? What people don't know is that Tarsus of Paul's day, they worshipped a god named Attis. Let's back up a second. Attis was from western Turkey. Tarsus is on the eastern side of Turkey, okay? That may not seem like a big deal now, but back then it was. Next, Attis was actually a Roman demigod. He wasn't a full god. He was a demigod, okay? And once again... It was from the Greek circles. Paul was was a Jew who lived in Tarsus, okay, so it would have had Roman and Greek uh, influence there, okay. But that doesn't mean that um, that Attis would have any, had any connection. Attis was actually connected with another city that was on, at the foot of a mountain farther to the west. If you know anything about his, history and, and gods and demigods and whatnot, certain cities would be tied to a certain god. Okay, like Ishtar, for instance, was um, I think it was Nineveh. Um, Anana was Ur or Uruk, one of the two. See what I mean? A certain god would go to a certain city. Now, obviously, there, at this time, there was widespread like where you just take something from all the all the religions and just kind of have this pig pile of religions. That that is true. However, um, saying that saying that people worshipped. Attis there. Well, maybe there was a cult of Attis there, but it wasn't a big thing in Tarsus. Tarsus wasn't known for the worship of Attis. Mm -hmm. So now let's go on to this next thing here. Um, uh, perhaps not coincidentally, Atlas was a dying and resurrecting god. That is true. Technically, Attis did die and resurrect. That part is true, but check this out. Um, he was not called the Good Shepherd. Attis was not called the Good Shepherd, and I couldn't find a single reference for him ever carrying a shepherd on, on, his, on his shoulders. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, sheep on his shoulders. I couldn't find a single reference for that. Not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying if it does exist, there's very little inf data for it. All the pictures for it had him sprawled out on like a couch, for instance, but there wasn't anything about a, sh a sheep. Okay? So once again, he's attributing something that's just not true. Addis was not known in Tarsus. There might have been a small group who worshipped him there. But by and large, no. In fact, Addis was the sideshow. The god that the detention was on was, was the woman that he was talking about, Siebel. Mm -hmm. She was the god. He was just a demigod, kind of like her plaything, almost. Right. Okay? And uh, so, anyways, uh, earliest speech shown by All these images were later incorporated. That's just not true. There is no evidence that Christianity stole its emphasis or its imagery from the Greek um, culture. There's no evidence for that. People like to tell you this, and they always like to say that. Jesus wasn't the first God to, to, to die and be resurrected. Well, now hold on. See what I mean? They're, they're going to throw a lot of things like that, but historically, there's not a whole lot of basis for these claims. Um, there are, have been gods that died and rose again. For instance, in Egypt, uh, way back in the days of Moses, for instance, um, the sun was a god that died every day and, and went down in, into the depths of Hades, and then every day he would come back up victorious. And the Pharaoh was an incarnation of this. Um, he was the sun god. You know, he was the Pharaoh himself was a god. So yes, there was the idea of a god dying and being resurrected. That wasn't that big of a deal. But once again, well, that's a conversation for another day. So I'll just go back on topic here. Um, I had a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, uh, I've, I've heard in the past that, you know, they, they, they find, uh, you know, um, dinosaur, uh, uh -huh. you know, skeletons, right. and, then, and then also I've heard that they found, uh, like, actual, like, biblical stuff that were in the ground, mm -hmm. and then they, they... They found like that they're they finding more about uh, you know, um, about God in the in the Bible uh -huh. and stuff like that. Like, and, and, uh, I don't even remember where I heard it, but I'm pretty sure I, I can look it up on YouTube. No, that's fine. Uh, what what was what you what are you getting at? 
Well, I was just saying, like, um, you know, like, like uh, they don't, you know, like the, the what ifs, and then people come at you and say this and that. And, um, uh, well, my, my point was just that they're fine. They're, I heard that they're finding, um, let me say this, uh, things about the Bible, uh, like in the, like in the ground, uh-huh. like uh, archaeology. Like, yeah, like like actual more information. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I've heard about that too, also. Oh okay. So like, there's, there's 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 more than, than what we know. Uh huh. You know. Right. Basically, what you're saying is that we don't have all all not all knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got what you're saying. Okay. Um. Okay. So uh, then, about the story itself, um, it, he actually got kind of the, some of the details wrong here. On their wedding night, Addis decided to make the supreme sacrifice and offer his testicles on the altar of his love. That actually didn't happen. What happened is she looked at Addis and he went crazy, and I think either ripped off his testicles or cut them off or whatever um, because he went crazy uh, from her looking at him. So that that's actually not. Very accurate. And then I couldn't find anywhere Addis's priest called the galley. Um, I don't know where he got that from. Uh, there is that. Once again, Addis wasn't really the main the main focus. Sybil was. And so I don't know if Addis' priest actually had a name. You know what I mean? Because it was just the cult of Addis. You know what I mean? And uh, yes, the, there, were, there would be people who castrated themselves to honor their, their gods and whatnot. Um, however, the, the, some of these things are just very ungrounded. And if you look, are there any um, are there any uh, references in the whole paper? Do you see any numbers anywhere? See any um, books Citation. quoted, citations of any kind? Basically, he's relying on his own knowledge and expecting you to believe it. Right. That should be a red flag. If it's going to be a scholarly article, there needs to be some references. So... Um, and then right here, although some early Pauline Christians, Church Father Origen, did castrate themselves. Actually, there's no substantial proof that Origen did. It is a possibility that Origen, who is a church, one of the church fathers, if you, if you know church history, uh, there is some evidence, there's a, more like a story, a rumored story that he did. There is no actual evidence for him. In fact, there's equal evidence that it could have been started by one of his enemies. And if you read his writings and consider his life... It seems very unlikely that he did that. So there's that too. So a lot of these things are just kind of said to be true, and there's not a whole lot of um, historical information for it. Um, <clears throat> so Paul did not uh, say that people should cut off their penises. He didn't say that. That that's true. I wouldn't do that. Um, right? <laughs> um, and also, if you notice, he he. Said he he referenced that that remember I was saying the argument of silence, he just did it again for the second time in his paper. Paul would certainly have invoked him as an example in arguing for celibacy, but he doesn't. Well, he doesn't use him as an example for the marriage either. That that it, it doesn't. So I mean, Paul talked about marriage and staying single, and he didn't use Jesus as a reference for either. That means you can't pick and choose and say that must means he got married. Well, that must mean he got celibate. See what I mean? You, you could go on either side with that. Um, if one looks at the Gospels without Addis colored Pauline glasses, there are many, many hints that Jesus was married. Actually, that's just not true. If you look at it, he had stuff to say about either, but references about the life of Jesus are somewhat slim. For instance, we don't know what happened between him being at the temple when he was a kid and him going into ministry at 30. Yeah. We don't know what happened. Why? Because the gospel writers weren't interested in recording everything that Jesus did. They were interested in recording the things that he did that were important for the story of the gospel. Right. That was it. So uh, you go down here. Um, after the crucifixion, the gospels agree that it was Mary Magdalene who went early Sunday morning to wash. It does say that Mary Magdalene went early, yes. However, it doesn't, say that she, it doesn't ever say that she was the only one who went that morning. Right. If you compare the gospels, it makes it out to be as though she was going with other ladies – and then she ran ahead. That's what it, what, what it right. kind of seems to imply. But nowhere does it ever say Mary Magdalene and only Mary Magdalene went to the went to the tomb. That's just not true. Next up, it says here, um, 
about this whole thing about anointing. Uh, the ancient Jews and Jews went around anointing each other. They didn't. No, of course they didn't go around anointing each other. <laughs> However, it was very common for people to anoint a dead body. Why? Why would they anoint a dead body? Because it stunk. They would anoint it with perfume as the body decomposed. If you compare the Gospels, it makes it absolutely clear. Friday night, they bought the stuff, and they, and they made the mixture to take. But then it was too dark to take it, so they waited until Sunday, the first day of the week. They couldn't do it on Saturday because that was the Sabbath. Okay, So they waited until that, su that Sunday morning to do it, and they went first thing in the morning. Mark doesn't make that clear. He just says... Um, Monday or the sun, uh, the morning of Sunday, they went, they went out and bought the perfume and took it took it out there. But Luke clarifies. He says Friday night they bought and they bought the perfume, but it, but they didn't do it that day. And then he says now then the, when they went on set on Sunday, they went in, to anoint Jesus. Luke is the only one who really clarifies that. Not that it's important, but you know if he's going to make it into an into a thing, we need to know what historically what actually happened. Um, and so what, what happened is men could only anoint – if I remember, men could only anoint men when they were dead. But women could anoint men or women. There's that. Next, there's no evidence that when they anointed someone, they'd be rubbing down the private areas. There, I couldn't find that anywhere. They would anoint the body with it. That didn't mean they were going to unwrap him. Right. See what I mean? Um, anyways, um, and so who would do this? Well – Close people ideally would probably be the first ones because Jews had had the idea of, of you know family and whatnot. But that doesn't mean that Mary had to have been a wife, but that she was very close with Jesus. Right. But we already knew that by reading the Gospels. So really, no big leap there. And then his mother was there also. Well, no big no big surprise there. And then there was someone else too, but it, or maybe a couple other people. But my point being, these were people who were close with Jesus, who followed him throughout his ministry. They were close with him. So um, <clears throat> then and now, no no woman would touch the bo naked body of a dead rabbi. Um, actually, if they were anointing someone for burial, they would do that. It wasn't the pa it wasn't Sunday or Saturday, so they would have had no reason for ritual cleanness. They couldn't have touched him on Saturday because they had to be pure for the Passover and whatnot. But anyways, um, <clears throat> next, if you go down here, besides the canonical Gospels, there are the so-called Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostics, or wisdom seekers, not true. Gnostic in Gnosticism comes from the word Greek word gnosis in Greek, which means knowledge, not wisdom seekers. Yeah. And all that it means is that because they, they, they looked for hidden knowledge from Jesus. Hidden teachings, things that nobody else knew. See what I mean? It, th by nature, Gnosticism is something that is unvalidated in and of itself. See what I mean? And we'll look at the Gnostic Gospels and just don't do this to me. Okay? <laughs> don't even. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then it says there were an early branch of Christianity. Gnosticism was not an early branch of Christianity. It was a Greek corruption of Christianity. How do we know that? Because we can compare Greek culture with Christianity. Greek culture had the idea that the soul and, spirit, soul and the body were completely two different things. Jesus could not have come in the flesh because the flesh is absolutely evil. See what I mean? Whereas the Christians said, no, Jesus did come in the flesh. He was fully human even though he was fully God, and he has a resurrected body now. And we are looking for the hope of the resurrected body. In the end, when the final trumpet sounds, we'll be given a, a resurrected body. See what I mean? Gnosticism is not what we agree. I know a lot of times nowadays you hear in the church, oh, our bodies are just sinful. No, we are sinful. Our body and our soul cannot be separated from each other. We are body and soul. We were created that way from the beginning. There is no point in, in, in life where we will not be body and soul. Flesh. Right. Yeah. No point in life will that happen. Um, so, uh, whose origins we don't know. That is true. We don't know the origins of Gnosticism. Um and the way he always shows them in a positive light, they were the losers of the Orthodox game. Actually, no, we have historically a church getting started, and then we have people trying to bend and manipulate what the church was doing. Right. That's what history shows. So it could potentially there be some other secret hidden group out there who were called Gnostics. And yeah, I guess hypothetically it could have happened, but we have such outstanding historical evidence that says that that didn't happen. See what I mean? So once again, these kinds of people are always going to do you guys kind of understand how to do that? Yeah. yeah. Take it apart bit by bit, paragraph by paragraph. Validate what they're saying. Look it up for yourself. 
it, could this be true? Or And if you go towards the end of it, I, I wanted to show you, but I don't want to waste any more time because it's already 7, uh, 7.30. And he says, this could have been how it was. It, it sounds so unhistoric. Like, it, it, it's a joke when you're reading. Like, he's gone through all these things saying, this is how it happened, this is how it happened. And then you get to his last paragraph, and he's like, so when you consider all, when you consider all these things, it, it could have happened. This could have happened, and, and there could have been this. It's like, okay, well, I yeah, guess. Sure. But don't you think that if, if he was married and he had kids and all that, don't you think in the whole entire Bible, don't you think they would have mentioned, mentioned it? Something yeah. mentioned about it? Yeah, I, I do. Personally, I do think that they would have mentioned something. Exactly. But yeah. now, last, and but certainly not least, I want to bring this up. If Jesus was married, get this, it would not have mattered. No. No. Check this out. Because marriage is not a bad thing. It was a thing given by God. And check this out. Sex is not a bad thing either. It was given by God. So would it have mattered if Jesus was married and if he had kids? Not at all. Would his divinity have been passed down to his children? No. No. Because Mary Magdalene was still human, right? Right. See what I mean? And with that being said... Jesus doesn't recreate other gods. That's Mormonism who teaches that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we will never be gods or angels. That will never happen. We are who we are. God made us this way, and that's who we will always be. Okay. The only difference is we'll be given a resurrected body, which is void of sin. That's the difference. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Awesome. So, now that we've looked at that, we can get on to the actual meat and potatoes of, of the night. <laughs> Should we believe the Gnostic writings? Well, there's for, there's a few things. First off, I know people always lean on the Gnostic Gospels like they're these. They should be included in the Bible because they're, mostly they're nonsensical. Like, if you read them, they don't make sense. I read parts of them to you before, how Jesus was all talking about uh, a woman, and he said, she must become like a man in order to be saved and all this nonsense, and... All these different things. It's like, what? What, the heck? what are you even talking about, Jesus? <laughs> and none of that, but it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't align with the with the yeah. with the older text, the gospels that we have. Um, written long afterwards, with the exception of the Gospel of Thomas, all of the Gnostic gospels were much, written much later. The Gospel of Thomas is the only go Gnostic gospel that can date earlier. And with that being said, it still doesn't date as old as, as the Gospels. So with that being said, we have to go with the older, more reliable texts that actually confirm one another. Um, claimed to be written by people they were not written by. They lied about who wrote it. The Gospel of Thomas written, was written by Thomas. So I mean, all, the, all these different Gnostic Gospels, they had nothing to do with the people who were actually there. So do you want to take the word of somebody hundreds of years later who is lying about who wrote it? Or the people who are actually there and lived during the time of Jesus walking on the earth. See what I mean? All right. No brainer. Let's say, for instance, Isaiah knows Donald Trump personally. Chuck has only heard rumors of him on the on the internet. Let, and then let's say Isaiah says, "Hey, Donald Trump says this," and and Chuck says, "No, he actually said this other thing." Who am I going to believe? Probably the one who was there when he said it. See what I mean? Why? Because you go with the more historical, why would you go hundreds of years later to the Gnostic Gospels? Um, they rely on secret knowledge, not historical, th th nothing historical in the Gnostic Gospels. It's, it's about the secret hidden stuff. Um, and also it was rejected by the early church, so you have to deny church tradition, you have to deny the Bible's authority, you have to deny all of that to, to, to take it. And also, the message isn't isn't on on key with the rest of Scripture. Um, the eyewitnesses were around when the New Testament books were being written. Luke personally asked and talked to them. He personally talked to them. What are the chances that a rumor about Jesus could get going? Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and none of the people who actually were alive to see it would have said anything. Furthermore, what are the chances that these people would have made up these gospel stories and then died for their belief in something that they already knew to be false? What are the chances of that? Right. But yet, that's exactly what people are saying when they say the Gnostic Gospels are more reliable than the... No, they're not. At best, they're interesting books that are, eh, hey, that's worth a yeah. read just to say, you re hey, I read the Gospel of Thomas. But it's not anything you can actually glean something from the Spirit by. Um, so when you're reading, check facts, especially from credible sources. Then recheck. Well, he quoted somebody. Go back and read what he quoted. Maybe he took it out of context. I'll give you an example. 
the Jehovah's Witness do this yeah. by quoting a, per, a Strong's Concordance, which is a which is a very common uh, Greek concordance uh, or lexicon, really. But basically, it's a dictionary in Greek. Um, and they quote him out of context, saying that he he backs them up. When the truth is, if you read the whole thing, he says the exact opposite of what they believe. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. I got a question about uh, Jehovah's. Uh, make it quick, cause I want to stay on topic for this. Oh, uh, okay. Well, well, I, I can wait. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's look at something that that's uh, that I, I just wanted to blow past the whole Gnosticism thing, cause I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let's look at something that actually is a little bit more applicable to us today, and that's sexism in the church. Um, if if you've been in the church for any amount of time, you know there's two really two groups. There's the one group where women are completely unimportant. Um, even like the Mormon tradition, for instance, where Jesus, where women can't even be saved apart for their from their from their man's from their husband's you know uh, influence and all this. Um, or so there's the idea that women are just not important, that they don't have rights, all these different things. And then there's the other people who go to the other extreme and say. You know, women. You know, like the feminist movement, basically. Um, the, the women that women do have all, all these rights, and and so it, that brings up a lot of questions because we look at like Ephesians, for instance, and where it talks about marriage. Do women really have to submit themselves to their husbands? What does the Bible say about that? Um, what does that mean? Does it, do we still follow the same practice nowadays, or was that uh, specific to their culture? Well, let's look at some of that. Excuse me. My computer does this thing where when you push um, the thing for it to pop up one at a time, you have to click it again. Um, yeah, First Timothy. Um, no, 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 Galatians. Um, you have to push it again on the other side for it to do it. It's stupid. Um, but Ephesians 5.22, <clears throat> it starts like this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body... In, it, uh, I'm sorry, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And that's kind of where they stopped. That's pretty cut and dry. Women are inferior, men are superior. That's the end of the story, right? But now, let's read what else Paul has to say about the marital relationship in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the, loved the church and gave himself up for her. Does that leave any error? For a man to have complete dominance over a woman, no, because it says, and gave himself up for the woman. In other words, G look at it like this. When you are married, you no longer have the right to put your desires above your wife's desires because of this, and gave himself up for her. See what he said there? Uh, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water uh, with the word, so that he might present the church himself in splendor. Christ did all these things so that to make the church sainless, right? Completely empty himself, okay? Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands, love, lo uh, love uh, your wives as your own bodies, okay? As your own bodies. So does that leave room for men being dominating over a woman? As your own bodies. And then he goes on, just in case you didn't catch what he said. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Basically what he's saying here, wives, you should submit to your, to your husbands. You should make the extra effort. Because a lot of times wives want to, you know, they want to com be combative about stuff, don't they? They want to say little things under their breath about their husbands. They want to argue with their husbands. If their husband says something, they want to turn and try. You know what I mean? He says, she said stuff. Yeah, kind of, yeah. And so he's saying, yes, wives, you should do that. But that was what was expected in the culture already. The women knew that they were doing wrong when they did that one. Here's the thing that the men completely overlooked. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Ooh. You mean there's another part to this? Mm. See, because husbands oftentimes took advantage of the wife. Oftentimes they would set themselves as alpha male, everybody else is under me. And Paul says the exact opposite. Um, and then verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
So what he's saying is, yes, that's a good thing for the wife to do that, but the story doesn't stop there. Husbands, you also should be doing this. Um, so then First Timothy, I said, I'll get that one right. You go ahead and read Galatians. Uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you understand what he's saying there? Sal through salvation, it the woman is equally an heir to Christ as I, a man, am heir to Christ. That's what he's saying. That's a significant statement. Basically what he's saying is it doesn't matter what you've been told, it doesn't matter what you believe, there is no longer male or female. You are both welcomed. See what I mean? They are both able to accept that. So if Christ gave them a full standing in salvation, did, could the argument then be made that a man has the right to treat her worse than Jesus did? Hmm. See me a little thin there. Go ahead and go to First Peter. No, First Corinthians, and I'll read First Timothy. Um, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, I'm not going to read verse 15 because that I'd actually have to do a study on 1 Timothy for that, and I don't really want to get into that. I just want to look at the verse itself. Um, because of tradition, this verse has kind of lost a lot of what he's saying in it. So I'll try to break it down in a simpler version because I will admit it's a little bit hard to understand in English. Actually, it's a little hard to understand in Greek too. Um, but uh, anyways, back to the thing here. Um, first off, this is not saying that a woman cannot be a pastor. Okay, I would just want to get that out right out in the open. Second off, this is not saying that all women to all men. I want to get that out in the open. Okay. Um, Paul never, ever, ever said, and really the argument could be said that the Bible nowhere says this, that women are somehow inferior or less than men. And so as a result, it never really says that women should, without cause, never have any plan. You can never achieve anything as a woman. You can never, which is what it's been, been equated as. A woman cannot make her place in society. It's a man's place to do that. And a woman has to stay home and take care of the babies. And if you don't have babies, somehow you're less of a person. And that's not what he's talking about at all. So the first thing is, from the context, it seems most likely he's talking about uh, husbands and wives. Um, so let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Um, I don't really have time to get into the words here, but basically what he's saying is he's talking about their demeanor. Like, for instance, earlier he says um, in chapter 2, uh, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Is the same words going on there, going on here. So he's not really talking about women not really having a place, not being able to talk. He's just simply saying your demeanor, how you present yourself, that should be one of, what's a good word to substitute? Respect. That should Your demeanor towards your husband shouldn't be contentious. Um, you should be... Um, you should have a calm uh, disposition towards your husband. Okay. Now, once again, though, at this time in the culture, women were expected to have that anyways. They're, they're expected to not, not necessarily be intelligent. They're expected to have a gracefulness about them. Okay. So uh, that's more of what he's talking about here. Um, uh, so anyways, and I don't really have time to get into this, but in verse 13 he says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. His point on that is... Um, a woman shouldn't be contentious and rise against her husband because the man was formed first, not her. See what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so wives then shouldn't be contentious toward their husbands because he was the one who was formed first. And then, um, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. See, the woman in the garden was deceived. Adam sinned willfully. He knew what he was doing and he did it. Eve was deceived. She had no idea what she was doing. Okay, but check this out. So what, what's the solution there? I um, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Let a woman learn. That's the part that, that, that people nowadays are missing. Instead of keeping them in the dark, let a woman learn. Because remember Eve? She was deceived in the Garden of Eden. How do we fight that from happening again? Let them learn. See? So uh, go ahead and read yours, buddy, First or First Corinthians. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. 
If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Basically, what's happening here is the exact same thing that happens in our church nowadays. Uh, women were being distractful and, 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 and talking in the middle of the midst of what was going on. It, it was causing people not to be able to pay attention. So Paul has a very, very simple solution. Ask your husbands at home. Mm -hmm. Rather than disrupting everything that's going on and having everybody be distracted by your talking, just hold on for a second. You can talk when you're at home with your husband. It's a very easy solution. Um, so then in 1 Peter 3, 7, go to 7, chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7. Um, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, obviously, if you know anything about the feminist movement of nowadays, their big thing is that anything you can do, I can do better, right? And this is one of the verses that, that irritates the feminists to no end. And so let's kind of break it apart. Um... Is he saying that women are inherently unuseful and men are inherently useful? Not at all. What he's talking about, it, there's two ways to understand it. The first is, and I think that this one's a less believable because of just the flow of what he's talking about. Women are not able to do as much heavy manual labor as men are. You know what I mean? Overall. You know what I mean? Like normally a, a guy who's digging a hole is, is going to be a guy digging a hole rather than a woman. Not all the time. Not all the time. Women do that stuff too. But by and large, uh, men are known for being the strong ones. Okay, I don't find that solution very realistic in light of the of the verse of what he's talking about. This is the one. This is what I kind of think that he's talking about, and this is this is my view, my personal view. Um, a woman has to, as the, as a wife, not a woman, but a wife has to submit herself down to her husband, and in essence, she has to humble herself to her husband. Okay, so with that in mind, with that in mind. Husbands, live, your, uh, li live with your wives in an understanding way. Don't be overly demanding of them. Don't be overly critical of them. Be in, live understanding. And it actually, in my Bible, it has uh, study notes, and I actually am going to read some of them. Um, Peter mentions four things about which husbands should be concerned. First, the husband must be considered an understanding of the wife. Husband should be considerate. Number two, the husband should treat his wife with respect as an equal. That's true. Um, the idea that woman is not equal to man is actually not a biblical one. I know it's been used that way, but that's not what the Bible says. Um, third off, a husband must take the lead in submitting his own interests and concerns for the good of his wife. A husband must take the lead in submitting his own will and desires. See, what people think is they think, okay, woman's a weaker vessel. That means man has complete say and the woman just has to go along with it. No. And then the fourth thing, a husband must never abuse his wife or treat her improperly in any way. So let's go back to the first. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Since she has humbled herself as God has told her to, be understanding in that and don't abuse it. See what I mean? Because she is willingly humbling herself at, at, in, in this relationship and, go, and, and, and submitting to your authority. So if you abuse your authority, then what happens? We'll read the rest of the verse. So that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, Peter is saying this. Your wife has submitted to you. If you abuse that, God is not going to listen to your prayers. Because you are abusing your authority. So what you're saying is like... If you mistreat your wife, no. God will not answer your prayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what he's saying. And I think that, that's, I think that the context makes it abundantly clear. I don't think he's talking anything about, about women being unuseful at all. Go ahead and read your verse. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So there's a few things. First off, Paul is not giving the order. You have to abstain from sex and marriage so as to, so as to go to the Lord in prayer. He doesn't say that. He says if you are going to do this, don't do it for a long time. Basically, what's happening is they write Paul and they say, okay, look, um, 
because once again, the Greek thought the flesh is completely evil, and if flesh is completely evil, that means sex is completely evil, right? It follows the line of thinking. So they, they write him and say, hey, we're married and we got saved. Should we abstain from sex? And he writes them back and says, no, not at all. If there's something comes up that you guys feel like you want to do it, make sure you're both on board with it. The husband and the wife both want to abstain from sex and then only do it for a limited time. Because what's going to happen is you guys are going to lead yourselves into, into adultery, into all kinds of sexual immorality. Because people are weak. That's just, we're sexually weak. I mean, come on. If we weren't, porn wouldn't be a thing today. Come on. <laughs> we're sexually weak. Um, so, But if you look at that, there's also something else I want to look at from the beginning there. He says, um, is it good to have, okay, I already talked about that. Um, because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife. Um, and if you look, he equated the man and the woman on equal uh, footing. The wife doesn't have authority for her own body, but hey, guess what? Man, you don't have authority over your own over your own body. So what this verse has been taken out of context to me is something called marital rape. That's where one of the partners does not want to have sex, and the other partner guilt trips them and forces them into sex because of this verse. That's not what it's saying at all. And we talked about this last week, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Sex is something that's supposed to be mutually affirming. And if it's a one-guy show, it's not sex. You might be using a body, but that's all you're doing, using a body. You're using your wife. See? Because it's supposed to be a mutual thing. And So what do you do if you're a guy and you want to have sex, but your wife doesn't want to have sex, and you just got to get rid of that urge? We'll talk about that later. Okay, probably next week or the week after. But I will say this. You will not die from blue balls. Okay? There is no medical condition that you will die from from not having sex. Okay? Just want to throw that out there. So if your wife says, no sex for you, it's not the end of the world. All right? I mean, can you just go relieve yourself? I mean... Technically, yes, but we'll look at masturbation next week. That's a, that's a good question. Um, there's something else I was going to say. Oh. Right before you said that, I said something. What did I say right before you said, said that? I said, uh, uh, no sex for you. No, I was right after that. Uh, <laughs> gum. Oh, yes. Uh, now, with that being said, we shouldn't... Did you know that a lot of times women will withhold sex from their husbands because their feelings are hurt? Did you know that? And did you know that a lot of times... Women, if they are not being adequately, feel like they're adequately loved, will withdraw sexually. If a woman doesn't feel like her husband is giving her the time that, that she wants, oftentimes she will withdraw sexually. Well, I'm not important. See what I mean? So here's a really easy, quick solution. Get, love your wife and give her the attention that she needs. And then she'll be a lot more willing to have sex with you. Throwing that out there. But with that being said, um, I think it is important that we don't purposely deprive each other of that. You know what I mean? Sometimes you're going to have sex with your spouse and you're not going to be 100% on board. You're not really going to be 100% into it. See what I mean? But still, you shouldn't you should abstain from your, from your spouse because, you know, for them, for their sake. You know what I mean? But with that being said, on the other, on the other side of that, you shouldn't expect your spouse to do that. You shouldn't demand that they do that and then guilt them if they don't. See what I mean? It's a two-sided thing. Okay? You can't just watch out for yourself, and you can't just watch out for your spouse. It's a two-sided thing. It's called sex. It's supposed to build married people together, not tear them apart. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. So now that we've covered all that, <laughs> the inner heart of a woman... I already talked about that. Uh, and I already talked about that, so I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, good. Um, any questions on that? That's how sexism in the church, in, historically in the church has been tilted towards the man's favor. Um, obviously, you shouldn't ever manipulate your spouse either. Withholding sex to get something, for instance. Making a large purchase without letting them know. You shouldn't be manipulative of your spouse. Okay, we're on board there. Okay, goes with sex too. You shouldn't be manipulating your spouse with sex. That shouldn't be a thing. Um, so... Obviously, because of this um, extreme sexism in one area, I mean, in one direction, whenever there's an action, there's a reaction, isn't there? Mm -hmm. What is it? Who said that? Einstein? Or, uh, you know, whenever there's a force, there's an equal or opposite uh, uh, opposing force. What is that? Action, there's an equal. Yes. Who said that? Um, 
Uh, was it Einstein or was it uh, Newton? Was it Newton? Isaac Newton, was that who it was? I think so. Yeah. So, yeah With his theory of relativity, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, anyways, if I'm wrong, just look it up on, online. Google has all the answers anyway. Um, so, obviously, because of man's stupidity, that drove woman to an equal stupidity. Feminism. Now, let me kind of go on board with this. At first, I was trying to disprove feminism tonight. And then I realized feminism isn't the, isn't the issue. The heart is the issue. Did you know that you can be a Christian and be a feminist, and that's okay? It's all right. Newton. New, it was Newton? Okay. Um, and, and in fact, feminism, the idea of feminism isn't bad either. Feminism's goal is to make women equal. That's its goal. That they would be paid the same that a man's paid. Right. That they would be, see what I mean? And, and that's not a bad thing. See what I mean? So I started rethinking it. I don't have to disprove feminism. I have to disprove some of the attitudes in the heart of some feminists. Mm -hmm. Understand the difference? Because I didn't understand it before today. And I really reevaluated what I was saying. First off, oftentimes a feminist is not interested with equality. They're interested in domination. They don't want to be equal with the man. They want to have this attitude of, of superiority. You know what I mean? Well, anything you can do, I can do better. Well, we're not really talking about that, are we? We're talking about being treated equally. See what I mean? And oftentimes I feel like feminism kind of goes over the edge of being treated equally to then trying to get revenge on the man, okay? Now, why is that bad? The same reason that that uh, part of the Black Lives Black Lives Matter movement is is potentially bad. Not uh, once again, I'm not against Black Lives Matter, okay? But some of the ideas of Black Lives Matter is this: we need to get revenge for the wrong we suffered in the past. See what I mean? But anybody who's ever slapped somebody who slapped them knows that it doesn't work, does it? It's a never-ending cycle of you slapping them and them slapping you and you slapping them. You guys ever seen that at the museum? <laughs> Where the monkey slaps me, yeah. slaps him back? Just like that. That's what vengeance does. Nobody wins. It just goes back and forth and back and forth. That's it. End of story. Like, the, it doesn't have a different outcome. <laughs> so, feminism is not wrong. Domination is. Right. Women were not made to be dominant over men, and neither were men meant to be dominant over women. In the marriage relationship... Uh, men were given a certain place, the same as a woman was given a certain place. But let me qualify that because that makes it sound like women stay in your place. And I'm not saying that. A pastor, for instance, has a place, right, in, in a church. He is, he is a shepherd. He's meant to watch over the church to train us to do our ministries, right? Uh -huh. to, to guide us, to, to guide us in salvation, right. equip us so that we can go out. But then we have a job too. We, we, we lift him up, we pray for him, we support him, and then we, we listen to him, and then we go on and, and raise other people, right? We, we all have our process in a cycle. Think of it like a, co a, a clock. All the cogs are rotating and they're all working. Have you guys ever seen Indescribable? I mean, I'm sorry, not Indescribable. Um, the Incredibles. It's like a clock. Yes, like a clock. Yes, like a clock. Exactly like that. I know he said it as a joke, but seriously though, it's like a clock and all the different cogs are working together so that the clock functions. It's the same thing with the marriage. Um, the husband has a certain job. The woman has a certain job. And, and, and they have to they have to deal with that. However, I will say this. Because of the culture changes, it is completely reasonable for a husband and wife to just sit down and talk as they get married and say, how do we want to do this? Do you want to be in charge of the finances? Should we both be in charge of the finances? Do you want to work? Do you want me to work? It's totally acceptable because the culture has changed. There, there's nothing wrong with it nowadays. Um, however, it does need to be something that you decide with your spouse. It doesn't need to be something that you decide and then you tell your spouse how it is. Well, I'm back from work, so you have to have the, have the meal ready. See what I mean? But with that being said, I will say this. One of my greatest joys as a husband is coming home to a house that has the smell of food, food cooking. It's one of my greatest joys. I love it. See what I mean? But I love food, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? There, there's sometimes you can do something for your spouse that you don't have to do, but you can do. You know what I mean? I came home for lunch today. I'm going to toot my own horn here, but not because I want to, just because it's an example. Um, I came home for lunch and did some of the dishes. Isn't that Gracie's job? No, it's our job. Who made the dirty dishes? We did. So who cleans the dirty dishes? We do. See what I mean? Equality. Um, so anyways. Um, a lot of times, um, whoever is working, they forget the person that stays home. It's not like they're just laying around. And right. Right. Yeah. I have that same problem. I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes I get all mad at Gracie. Like, why is the house still messy? 
Well, she was watching Micah all day, you know. She was doing other things all day besides just sitting there cleaning all day. You know what I mean? Like, right. she did have a to-do list. See what I mean? The same as I, I would get upset with her if, if she if she called me at work and said, Hey, well, you're sitting there doing nothing. Why well, get mad at her, wouldn't I? Because I am doing something. So why is it okay for the one who works to do the exact same thing? I'm gl really glad you brought that up. Um, also, feminism oftentimes overlooks the woman's uniqueness. A woman is nothing like a man. I even saw it online. Something It said along the lines of this. A woman wasn't created to do everything the man could do. She was created to do everything a man couldn't do. And I'll agree with that. A woman was created to do things that man couldn't do. So, I mean, that's an important, important thing there. So... Um, extremism, it, feminism is an extremism which encourages further alienation. Rather than saying, make us equal, make us united, feminism takes that oftentimes, not inherently, but oftentimes it takes that and says, no, a rift has been, have, has been caused by man's stupidity, so we're going to further the divide. That's not a good attitude to have. We should be trying to build people together, right? That's what I have a problem with the Black Lives Matter. P did you know that black, black people shouldn't have to? picket for equality. They shouldn't have to be out there fighting for their rights. That shouldn't be a thing. They should be given them already. Women shouldn't have to make signs and go picket for feminist movements. They should already be, be, be paid equal as men. They should already have the rights in society. There's no reason not to. See what I mean? And what you're telling them is you're saying you have, you have to fight the battle of not being treated as a person because it's not important to me. That's not right. Christians should be at the forefront of equality. See what I mean? So with that being said, feminism isn't inherently evil. We should stand up for, for the rights of other people. Um, but we should never, ever, ever do so at the stake of vengeance, where you're just trying to further alienate. You did this and it was wrong, and now you have to repay for it. See what I mean? That's just going to be an endless battle. Would it still be okay if a man said it? it think of some of the things feminists say. Uh, oh, well, you don't have any right over my body, do, 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 do. Well, is that right if a man says that? Well, it's kind of arrogant. So should a woman say, well, that's probably arrogant in a woman, too. See what I mean? And, and, and kind of just stop and ask yourself, well, put it in somebody else's shoes, and, and if they said it. Like, for instance, I'll go back to the Black Lives Matter because it's kind of a big thing nowadays. Um, so I've, I've heard some Black Lives Matter movement people say some really racist things. Now, imagine that they said the exact same thing, but imagine they were white, and they said it about white people. I'm just proud of my heritage. That's called the skinheads. They they actually, they, what are they called? Um, the Clarion. Uh, yeah, the Ku Klux Klan. The the skinheads. The there's another name. Aryan Aryan, Aryan, Aryan Brotherhood. Yeah, Aryan. that's what they're all about. They're real proud of their their culture. You know what I mean? And what hap what's happened is, we as people no longer have our individual culture. As Americans, we have what's called a, a unified culture. The American culture is one of diversity. It includes the past and the present. See what I mean? Because if it just included the past, and that would have meant that this is still Native American territory. Right. See what I mean? But it's not, is it? Because Native Americans are now part of the American government. See what I mean? We are America. We are. And what's happening is all the different groups are doing that. They're making further groups. See what I mean? But the truth is, being Hispanic, being black, being white, that's not being American. Being American is being American. I mean, and so like things like this riot, what is that resolving? It's destroying our cities, destroying our economy. It's making us further divided. Should we stand in the gap for black people who've been mistreated? Yes, yes. Should we stand in the gap for Hispanics? Yes. I mean, goodness sakes, that shouldn't even be a question. But should we do it at the st at the at the sake of killing police officers? No, no. Should we do it? I thought violence wasn't the answer. Isn't that what they were just saying a few months ago when Hillary Clinton was running? Violence is still not the answer to this problem. We need to be unified together. We need to build each other up. We need to make sure that we're there for people who feel like the government is taking advantage of them. We need to make sure that they have a safe haven with us. Christians should be known for their love, not their attacking. Goodness sakes, guys. So, men must own up, own up to their problems. I, that's just... Oftentimes we do this. Well, that was in the past. Well, yeah, but oftentimes, even nowadays, we're still guilty of this. You know what I mean? We still mistreat people sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Own up, own up to it. You know what I mean? Don't, don't always push it. Own up to it. You know, you're right. I, I did, I did mistreat you. I'm sorry. Let's work towards resol resolving this. Um, 
And men must treat women as equals and with respect. That's just, a, I mean, this isn't something that, that should have to be taught. And this is just something that should be common sense. Um, but people, what people do is they take those verses that I mentioned and they take them out of context and say, okay, that must mean that women should be abused. What? And by the way, guys, things have been, have been, val things have been um, validated, things like abusing your wife. Things like, once again, marital rape. All these things have been validated by those same scriptures that we read. Okay, So once again, you can twist the Bible to say anything that you want it to say. Legitimately. You could, you could twist the Bible to say that it's okay to murder people. You could. I mean, you, you can make the Bible say whatever. Here's just some examples of, of why the feminist movement is so worked up right now. These four guys all raped somebody and got away with it. Two of them had sex with unconscious people. This dude here, Brock Turner, raped unconscious girl, sentenced to three months. He mistreated another human being sexually and gets three months. Okay, that's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. She was, she was taken advantage of. Okay, this guy up here, Austin Wilkerson, raped unconscious freshman. No jail time. Nothing. This guy, John, John Enix, pleads guilty to raping two women. Got one year. No jail time. That's not justice. That's not fair. See what I mean? So yes, does the feminist movement have something to be upset about? Yes, yes, they do have something. It is an, it has gotten to be a, a, where things are more and more divided in America. Which I know President Obama was talking all about you, you being united and being united, but we are not united. I know he talked about it, but we the people are not living that. See what I mean? We are not being united. We are letting the little things divide us. If you don't believe me, look back on 2016 in social media. Nothing but people getting their feelings hurt about stuff. Nothing but that. I mean, goodness sakes. And then we had clowns to top it all off, which I was like, oh, good God, no, no. <laughs> but anyways, um, so this is kind of a chart of how consent works because I, I know people don't teach on this, so let's just make this real simple. Can I do this? Should I keep going? Do you want this? Are you feeling good about this? Do you like this? Simple questions. If the answer is yes, that means you can do it. If the answer is no, that means you should stop doing it. If you are doing this thing and they say, okay, I've changed my mind, they change their mind. Stop doing it. Very, very easy chart. And if they're unconscious and cannot say yes or no, just assume that it's no. If you start and they said yes and then they become unconscious, you should stop because they're no longer conscious. I mean, I don't understand why people are so stupid that they... Well, she was unconscious. What? 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 Anyways, you have to go? Yeah, I have to. Sorry, see ya. Oh, it's okay. Sorry, I, I went so long. Um, and this is this is another example of just some of the things that feminist posts. Uh, if you say that a woman wearing revealing clothes deserves to be sexually assaulted, you are saying that a woman's body is inherently deserving of rape. Now, I actually, I actually agree with this. Sh Let me say both sides. First off, it would be very nice, women, if you didn't wear in a way that makes it uh, wear things that makes it harder for me to not lust. I would appreciate it if you didn't. However, with that being said, that doesn't give you the right to act on a feeling. That's like saying a, a, a child raping was, it's okay because the child deserved it. What? <laughs> see what I mean? That doesn't really follow, does it? You see what I'm saying? Just because you have the urge to do something doesn't mean you should do that thing. I was in the store and I really wanted to steal. Does that give me the right to steal? Well, the stuff was no. there. I mean, exactly. It wasn't locked up. It wasn't locked up. That means I can steal it, right? No. No, that doesn't mean that at all. So anyways, I actually do agree with this one. Um, it, it's not fair to blame it on, on a woman. She got raped because she deserved it. She shouldn't dress like that. What? What? Maybe it made it harder for you to resist the temptation, which is, you know, sad. But, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's justified in the raping. Fun fact. In addition to being wives and daughters and mothers and sisters and grandmas and aunties, women are also people. This is something that men still today overlook. That, oh yeah, my wife, she's actually a person and she needs validation. See you know what I mean? We forget that life isn't all about us. Somewhere up here it just kind of gets lost. And we have to remember, oh yeah, there's a person in there. Especially in today's culture. Why important, especially in today's culture? Because pornography has taken such a hold in our culture that women are objectified. Which means that they're not going to be seen as people. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be looked at as... Uh... 
to say this, whores. But... Yes, exactly. And you know what the thing is? Is social media actually encourages us too. If you listen to yeah. modern hip hop music, for instance, it talks about women, you know, as as bees and stuff. And... Chicken heads. Well, even <laughs> even the female artists. Right. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Themselves. Yeah. As the same thing. Yeah, and and so there is that. It's like, well, our kids aren't being taught values of people's lives. They're seeing things on the internet. They're seeing things on Twitter. They're, this is life now. They're hearing things exactly. They're hearing things on music. music yeah. This is life, and it, and if we don't explain to them things, and if we don't teach them how to go through things, remember we were talking about um, earlier this year or last year about uh, analyzing media. Remember we were talking about that? Not just listening to music, analyzing what you're listening to, making sure it's good for you, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, same kind of stuff, stuffs going on here. And the thing is, feminism overlooks the main problem a lot of the time. Pornography. And, and men being allowed pornography. Because oftentimes they do this. There's nothing wrong with pornography. No. Pornography is a problem. We have we live in a rape culture where it's actually okay to rape people. And it's not okay to make, a, make it an issue. But the root of the issue, pornography, is completely overlooked. What is pornography other than an encouragement of rape? I mean, goodness sakes. So anyways... Uh, funny how sex is an irresistible human urge when a man rapes a woman, but when a woman gets a pre uh, gets pregnant and wants an abortion, she should have been smarter and thought twice before having sex if she didn't want a child. That's actually a good point. Men don't have to pick up the pieces of the broken lives that they ruin when they sleep sleep around, and a woman does. Why? Because the egg's in here. It, it's in here. She kind of carries it around with her. Is that fair then to go around sleeping around like a whore and then call the woman a whore? And then ha make her have to deal with the child? No, that's not fair. That's why I strongly encourage, don't have sex outside of marriage. For your own sake and for others, pe other people's sake. For your own sake, okay? So you won't be screwed in this situation. And actually, literally, too. And uh, second, so that... Well, I already said so. I'm just going to move on. Um, now, this is a story that I thought was interesting. I don't really want to get into too much of it, but I need femi fem feminism because when my stepfather was molesting me, all my mother could say when she found out was, if you tell anyone, you will, you will ruin this family. Every time I told someone about my abuse, I later recanted because my mother would blackmail me by threatening to tell people that I was a slighted little girl, and therefore I asked for what he did to me. True story right here. That's not acceptable. See what I mean? And let me, let me, do the, let me just say this. There is no situation where you need to cover up the rape of somebody else. There is no situation where that is okay. And I know, well, he's the father, or he's the friend, or he's the... It does not make it right. And if left unchecked, people could die. People's emotions are already being strained too hard. That's not okay. That's not okay. And so don't... And First off, don't, don't talk down to somebody who is raped. And also, don't be un unforgiving. They might. Not, did you know that a woman who's raped might not be that understanding of men? She might not like men that much. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Should you condemn her for not liking men? No. Because she was raped. Give her time. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Give her time. Um, and never justify the rape mentality. Never justify it. It's their right. It's their body. They have a right in what happens to their body. Okay. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about abortion here because abortion, it's not your body. It's a body inside of your body. I'm not talking about abortion. But I'm talking about sex. It, it has to be consensual 100% of the time because it's their body and your body. So, um, And then the, here's an example of how Christians have handled this in the past, and we'll stop on this. Hey, Pastor, if there is a God, then why did he allow me to be molested when I was only 10 years old? I kicked and cried for God to save me, and he never did. Where was God, Pastor? I need to know. A genuine question from someone genuinely hurting. And this is the answer. Who knows? It could have been a blessing in disguise. Maybe a life lesson for a sin you've committed. Everything happens for a reason. Everything, in, everything is in God's plan. The Bible tells us in the books of Proverbs to lean not on our own understanding. We are not supposed to question the Lord. All I can say is you probably sinned. Accept your punishment and move on. Holy crap. Yeah. A good example of how unhelpful Christians have been in the past. So when you read things on the media, just a second. When you read things on the media about against Christianity... You know where they're coming from, okay? Uh, you, you get where they're coming from. This was off of. Uh, I think I don't know. Uh, I think it was on a fa on a Facebook, but I don't remember exactly uh, so what the source was. Somebody is. Yeah, the top person was raped when they were ten, 
and the bottom person is a is a supposedly a pastor. I'd like to see his credentials and what is what denomination he's with. But anyways, um, yeah, and so there's just this, this thing of you know Christianity not being able to meet the needs of the culture, and we need to seriously stop and analyze our culture and say we need to start picking our battles. And do you want to be known by love or by do you know what I mean? By by your own personal issues and whatnot. We want to be there for people, right? We want to see people saved. We want to teach them about the love of Christ, right? We need to act with the love of Christ. Go ahead and say whatever you're going to say, Chuck. Oh, I was just going to say, how, how would he feel if that was his daughter that was raped? Yes. Right? If somebody did that to, to Teresa, I, I, she's not even born yet, and I'd, I'd throw a fit. Goodness sakes. <laughs> But yeah, that, that, that's very true. It's like, well, that, get off your high horse there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, some things are pretty irritating. But anyways, I'm sorry we didn't get to get into the marriage section, but at this point, it's already 8.15. If I want to keep going, I'm going to have to be talking real fast. <laughs> um, the thing at the beginning took up a little bit too much time, and I started a little bit later than I intended to. So, Any questions about what we talked about? I, I know I said a lot of information. I said it very quickly. It will be posted online probably by tomorrow, so you can go back and look up any of the parts that, that were confusing or whatever. And if you had any questions, write them down, and we can discuss them next week, or you can ask them now. Either or. Or there's a question box if you wanted to be anonymous. Okay? We're good? No questions? I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to do it. Was, was there a...